My wife, Karen, is over there. She's Karen Benjamin, she and I uh, are in business together. Uh, and I've been a pro for 40 years. Um, I started off with a camera in my hands when I was about 10. I grew up not too far from the uh, SVA buildings on First Avenue in Stuyvesant Town. And uh, I, I, love, I was just enamored with photography. My dad was a fairly good amateur. I got the same camera he did so I could borrow his 135 millimeter lens. And when I went to Stuyvesant High School, I took my first photo class. And to this day, I remember that experience of seeing that first white piece of paper turn into an image. And let me tell you something. I said to myself, I want to do that. And it got me hooked. And uh, I was in, in college, in, in high school, I had a camera in my hands, and I started teaching New York City Board of Education. Um, and I went into photography full time the summer we got married. And I've been doing this ever since, and I just love it. And if you got a job that you love, it's, 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 it's the best thing. Um, photography, just talk about a basic for a moment. Uh, the Greek word photos meaning light, and graphy meaning the process of drawing. So photography is really drawing with light. Uh, amateurs. Basically, an amateur just hit the shutter. What's ever there, you take a picture, and you don't do any preparation or any thinking beforehand. As a professional, we've got to control the light to make it something else and to make it something that looks better. Uh, an artist's medium can be oils, charcoal, pastels, clay, granite, many other me uh, materials. Photographer's medium is light. That's what we work with. Light is our palette, our paintbrush, and the contrast between shadows and highlights creates the illusion of depth on a two-dimensional plane of every photographic image. It's the light that makes it pop, that gives it depth. Now, uh, I have a, about a four-minute slideshow here, and each one of the images shows you what light does and the, the, the ability to make it into something that's really special.
think you get a pretty good idea of the variety of stuff we do. We're, we're uh, primarily a people photographer, and I've uh, always, always loved that the most. All right, now, when uh, Karen first got interested in photography, I gave her a little piece of advice, which I give to everybody. The most important thing about photography, look for the light before you take your picture. Where is the light coming from and what it's doing when it hits the subject. That's what you got to look for. Now, if you can't move the subject and you can't move the light, move yourself. Here's a typical getting ready shot for, for a, a wedding. Karen actually uh, uh, shot this. Uh, where's the light coming from on this? It's window light, okay? It's, it's, coming, it's coming from this direction. If she was shooting directly into the window, what would happen to the subject? You get a silhouette. So in order to do that, we got a nice split light there on the face because the photographer moved to see, this, to see the relationship of the subject and the, and the light. Static light source. Altering a camera angle creates visual excitement. Uh, matter of fact, this picture over here was one of the first photos that I ever did with uh, uh, my new EOS cell, uh, camera. This is, goes back about 20 years. And uh, I was in the dentist's office, and I had uh, done his family's pictures. Um, and he came in, the, uh, all the people in the office came in, and I, I just was playing with it. And this went into competition and won a loan collection. You know the title on this? This was called, uh, This Won't Hurt a Bit. But it's just a question of where the light's coming from and make, making sure that it looks interesting. Okay, qualities of light. There are three things we're going to talk about today. Direction, contrast, and intention, intensity. Direction of light, you have direct light and off-camera light. What, visually, what is the difference between these two photographs? What makes this different from this? Time of the day. Time of the day, yes, exactly, time of the day. Where is the light coming from here? Okay, it's coming high noon, okay? Here, this is towards the end of the day, this is that golden light right before sunset. What makes this more dramatic than this? Take a look at the shadow and the highlight definition here. It gives dimension. This is flat, this has dimension, and all it has to do with the direction of light in relation to your subject and your camera. You did the same thing with people. A friend of mine, okay, shot this, direct flash. This was done with uh, actually window light also, but there's a direction there that was done with a reflector and so forth. Same face, different light sources, but different direction of light. It gives shape and dimension. Uh, when we got married, uh, we had a photographer. Well, we didn't know a lot of good photographers. Then I hired somebody, and he just shot with a flash. Basically, you have very flat lighting over here. Okay. This is the difference where directional off-camera light creates dimension and that, that look of, of three dimension. Contrast is the ratio between the highlight and shadow areas. Off-camera light creates highlights and shadows and the illusion of depth by providing contrast to the image. I say again, the illusion of depth because it's what the eye is picking up. Low contrast, you can tell, has light shadows. High contrast has dark shadows. So when you're looking at something, you're looking at a photograph, you could really tell what the uh, level of contrast is. Very simple. This over here is a low contrast shot because the difference between the highlight area and the shadow area is very, very minimal. This, you have a light source coming from the same direction, okay? But because there is a deeper shadow here, you have more dimension and you have high contrast. Now, quality and intensity of light. One of the first people that I studied with was a fellow by the name of Dalfo Vachier, a Colombian photographer, uh, is a good friend of mine, and I took a class with him, of, uh, and he described light as a liquid. Think of light as a liquid, okay? Put that image in your head. You can have a gentle spray, or you can have a harsh torrent. 
And light is just like that. If you have a light source that is uh, a hard light source or a heavy light source such as bright sunlight, or you can, you can have the, the light source from an open shade or overcast day. That's the differences in the intensity. Again, soft light gives you soft shadows. Hard light gives you hard shadows. Again, when you evaluate any photograph, think of those, think of the quality of light and, and the contrast. Example, soft lighting, hard lighting. Look at the depth of the shadow. And always look at the shadow and realize opposite the shadow is your light source. So anytime that you're looking at something, uh, this is very obvious where the light is coming from. But over here, you have a very soft shadow over here. Your light source is coming from the opposite direction. It's a good way to evaluate any photograph in terms, and, and any subject. Think about where your light is coming from. Okay. Varied contrast levels with a soft light source. Both of these are, were shot uh, the same day uh, with a fairly high overcast, so it's a soft light source. The, this over here is a soft light source, but there's high contrast. Reason there's high contrast is there's very little reflect, uh, light reflected into the, to the uh, shadow area there. Over here, we have a reflector that was much closer. This is actually um, a, a, a door, a white door over there, and it's bouncing the light into there so you have a much softer shadow. So a soft light, low contrast, soft light, hard, uh, 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 high contrast. Now, here you have a light source that is done with a hard light source. There's high contrast over here. Again, this is towards the end of the day, but again, you, fairly deep shadows. Now, this is a low contrast. You still had uh, um, a very harsh light source. The reason why the shadows are, are much softer and more transparent is that there was almost a wall over here that was reflecting bouncing light back into them so that the uh, the look is not as harsh and again these are all things that you should be looking for when you're photographing and think about what you want to do what kind of end result you want to have for your photograph now there are two types of light there's ambient light ambient light is produced by the environment it's both a constant as well as a static source of illumination. It cannot be moved in relation to the camera subject. And examples of sunlight, moonlight, window light, daylight, and room lighting. The room lighting we have here is a ambient light source. We're not being, we can't move it. Artificial light is usually man-made uh, and is basically created electronically. Flash units are instant sources of illumination. Studio hot lights, video lights, a flashlight, an iPad screen or a candle or constant light sources. All can be moved in relation to your subject and camera. One of the coolest photographs taken of me is a friend of mine uh, by the name of Rudy Pollack. We were in a uh, restaurant in Chinatown and he photographed me using his iPad as his light source and someone was holding up a handkerchief as a reflector. And it was really, I mean, it's, you can improvise, but the concept is exactly the same. Now, I want you to look at the different types of light, the sources of light. Open shade, daylight, cloudy or overcast day, sunlight at midday, which is actually equivalent in terms of the look to electronic flash, fluorescent lighting, sunlight an hour before or uh, uh, dawn, uh, after dawn or before sunset, tungsten photo flood, incandescent, sunrise, sunset. Okay, and if you take a look at what the quality of the temperature of the light is. It makes a difference in terms of the color. Look at these skin tones. This was taken the same time. Uh, this was done actually just with the modeling light in my uh, studio unit. And if you take a look at the backgrounds, you take a look, you can see uh, uh, the same kind of hue. It's, it's more of a, of a yellowish golden hue to the skin tone. This was done same place with the strobes. And if you take a look, there's a difference in the color of the skin tones. There's much more of a blue hue to this and much more of a yellowish uh, uh, look to that. Have you ever taken pictures with, say, this kind of lighting and everything comes out yellow or orange? Well, what's happening is that your camera is, uh, your, your light source is an incandescent light source and it basically looks yellow. 
And with digital, we can, we can adjust for that. When we're working with film, you really couldn't. Take a look at this chart. I'm not going to go down with all the numbers uh, here. But you look how you go from the coolest light, which is open shade with a clear blue sky, and is the bluest, all the way down to sunrise or sunset, which is the red. And the color temperatures are in Kelvin. So this goes from 7100K down to 2000K. And each one of those color uh, uh, shifts in color temperature had, had visually creates a different look to your subjects. And you have to be aware of that as well. This is open shade with a clear blue sky. Okay, good skin, skin tones on this. This is daylight. We're going down from 7,000, this is now to 6,300K. Cloudy overcast day at 6,000. This is midday at 5,400. Okay, now we're going down to electronic flash, which is the same 5,400K. has the same color temperature as bright sunlight. Fluorescent. Fluorescent generally has a greenish cast to it, and you have to be aware of that. Sunlight an hour uh, after dawn, going down to tungsten photo flood. Incandescent, and at sun, sunrise or sunset. So you can see visually how the colors change. And our cameras, when we're setting up our ca cameras, we have to be aware of that and change the color temperature of the camera to, set, to, to coincide with what our light source is. Now here we have mixed light sources. We have tungsten from this, from, if you take a look over here, we have a tungsten light source up over here, which is giving a, a cast of a yellowish cast. Now, if I set the camera to cloudy day, which is a 6000K, you get that tungsten shift and it looks yellow. I change the camera setting to tungsten, which is 3200K, and because it's a mixed light source, you have an outdoor light source, everything starts looking blue. How do you handle that as a professional photographer? You can't, one, one is too yellow, one is too blue. Well, if you add bounce flash, this is what I did here, okay? I camera set was electronic flash, which is 5400K, and I've cleaned up the colors so that you are now balancing out that daylight light source, the incandescent light source, and the main light source is actually flash, and the camera is set to that. Now, here we have the camera set at tungsten, which is 3200K. This, by the way, Karen, Karen shot this, and this was done with, on a very, very low light level, okay? Uh, these lights were basically lighting the subject. The sky was basically almost completely dark at that point because we shot this, this was shot um, at a, a fairly high ISO. So we were able to uh, get the image looking good. But what was happening is because this is really skylight and it turns blue, you have that very intense blue. It, it was much darker uh, to the eye, but the camera uh, picked it up and changed that to a very deep blue. All right, placement of the light. Consider the source of the light is it natural or artificial. And remember, only artificial light can be moved. Subject matter, what do you want to emphasize? The viewer's eye always goes to what's brightest in a subject, in a, in, in a picture. And if you want to de-emphasize something, put it in shadow because the viewer's eye looks away from it. Now, before we do anything else, the next picture, I want you all to squint, okay? You're gonna look at this like this, okay? And I'm gonna count to three and I'm gonna turn around. Everyone squinting? It's like putting on the 3D glasses at, at the movies? Okay, good. What is your eye picking up when you're squinting? Where does it go to? The dark area, the light area? Okay, open the eyes a little bit, okay? This is upside down. That's a great way of looking at photographs, by the way. If you want to get a sense, hold it upside down and go like this, okay? Where does your eye go to? And if that's where you want to bring the attention, okay, then you're doing the right thing. If your eye is going to someplace other than your subject, then you have to think maybe this, uh, we have to either crop or do some adjustment to the photograph to make your eye go to the main subject area. Now, I've got to say, this particular shot, we emphasized the contrast here, okay? This is done artistically, um, and again, the whole idea here is to bring your eye to the main subject here, which is that circle right around here 
of the arms around the man. Now, again, highlights bring your eyes directly to the subject. What's the main subject in this, in this photograph? Tell me, what, what's the main subject? Go ahead. Exactly, okay? This is a maternity shot, okay? We have a main subject here, mother. This is the main subject here. The father is a secondary figure. As now, usual. pardon me? As usual. As usual. Oh, absolutely, okay? Uh, now, w this was put into competition. Uh, again, this is a shot. Uh, uh, Karen composed this, uh, worked on this afterwards. And we were given some advice by some of our colleagues that we should crop it differently. Look at the difference in crop here, okay? What happens to the secondary subject? The secondary subject was thinned out. Now, for, for the clients, this kind of cool tat, that's nice, that's the, sh the shot that, they, that they, they purchased and is on their wall. This is what we put into competition because the eye goes directly, you see the leading line down over here? from the father's arm leading right to the baby. This is what the subject is. So that the use of shadows and highlights is very important in composing any kind of photograph. Whether it's a portrait of people or this, it's a landscape. Just know where you want your eye to look and that's the main subject. Now, highlights can bring the, uh, the eye to the main subject that's in shadow. Here we have, obviously the main subject is not the background there. That's background. But because they are in silhouette, your eye goes to them because they're standing out against the light background here. Now, sometimes you can break the rules. What's the main subject in this photograph? You have the couple there. What else? Yeah. Well, if you take a look, what's sharp over here is the little girl. She's dark, okay? This obviously is much lighter. However, she is silhouetted against the bride's dress. And if you take a look at the expressions over here, they're looking at her. So this, they're secondary subjects. This is the main thing. Had, had the arm goes in again, and you have a leading line right into the little girl. Karen was behind this, uh, the little flower girl. I was, portrait, I was doing portraits against these flowers over here with window light when the kid walked in. And we gave it a title because when you enter pictures in competition, titles are important. The title of this, and Karen came up with this, she's great with titles, is, Is He Still My Big Brother? Now think about the storyline here. And the funny thing is, realistically, she's the, the bride's sister, okay? But we made the storyline because look at the, the eye contact and the expression of the groom looking at the little girl. The bride was a little tired, she didn't have as much eye contact. So we made the, the story based upon what, what we wanted the people to look at. But again, your eye is drawn to the, the girl because she's silhouetted against there. Now, a couple of important portrait lighting terms I'm gonna be using, and I think it's important for you all to, to know. When you have a main or a key light, that's the light that illuminates the subject and that gives it the highlights. It's generally located off camera, and it's generally the strongest light source of which the image uh, exposure is based. The fill light. Fill light exposes the shadow areas and it's usually placed near camera. Kicker or an edge light. It gives dimension and separates the subject from the background and is located usually 45 degrees behind the subject. Coming in behind the subject. A hair light generally comes straight down, eliminates the top of the subject from above and a back or a rim light is a light source located behind the subject pointed at the subject. So I'm gonna be using these terms interchangeably and I want you to be aware. I didn't, and if I'm using any terms that someone doesn't know, just ask me, I'll be glad to explain it. That's really important. Okay, we have a sa sample studio lighting setup, okay? Camera, the main light is 45 degrees from the camera. Fill light is basically at the camera level here. I'm using a reflector. I have a kicker light coming here, and this hair light is actually coming straight down. So that, that gives, that's a, basically a studio lighting situation, okay? Here we have two people photographed in that uh, kind of lighting setup. The main difference between the two is what? Visually, what's different between these two, besides the fact that one's a guy and one's a girl? Okay, okay, you say hair light? 
actually, the hairline. Oh, the hairline. Yes, yes, the hairline. Yes. As they say, hair today, gone tomorrow. Uh, but what what what's the difference in the lighting on this? Take a look. Take a look. What what is lit and what's not lit on on uh, on one and uh, as opposed to the other? Okay. Well. Well, it was it was diminished. Okay, he, he said that there's more rim light on, on the young lady than on him. That's true because I didn't want to em overemphasize any of the, bold, uh, the boldness there. But the basic difference here is background. This is, this is a dark background that is a lighter background. And the reason why I have that background, this happens to be the postmaster, retiring postmaster of Manhattan, and I was asked to photograph him uh, as an, a present on his retirement. And we brought in the flags. That's the flag uh, uh, that was at 9-11 uh, uh, at the pit. And we brought that in. And I actually had, the lighting on this is actually identical with the exception I had a second light over here lighting up the background. This light was feathered so it lit the background and gave him a little bit of a, of a kicker light there. I had no background light on this. But otherwise, it's the portrait lighting. It's the main light on my camera left, it's a fill light, and it's a kicker light. The big difference is that I'm using a, back, a hair light on, uh, a, um, uh, a background light on this. Now, we have a stationary light source, okay, with a natural light. This is window light. Both of these are photographed exactly the same way. I'm working with my light source coming from the right here, okay, you have a nice light pattern over here. You have a nice, fairly transparent shadow, and there's a reflector. I have a portable reflector there that is reflecting the light uh, onto the side. I can't really move my light source, but I can move my, my, my subjects and my, my, my camera position. Now, here we have a back or rim light, okay? This is a natural light versus artificial light sources. But the, the effect on the subjects is exactly the same. Uh, it's very important in shooting right into the sun to, to get a full silhouette is to make sure that you actually block the sun. And when you're exposing it, you expose for this area over here, not the sun. You want, you want that to go nice and dark. Here, I had a flash behind the subjects, pointed at them, but I had a fairly long shutter speed because I wanted to get a lot of that ambient light from, from the chapel area there. But b basically, this is the same kind of lighting. One's natural and one's artificial. Now, Shooting into a back or a rim light creates some very dramatic effects. But you've got to be aware, again, over here, remember what I said when you're shooting directly into the sun? Make sure that you use the subjects to block that, otherwise you just get a, a flare. And the, 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 if you're using any automatic uh, settings, your camera is going to totally get whacked out because it's trying to expose for that s sun itself rather than the subjects. Now. Look for the shadows as well as the light. This beautiful portrait, and again, I gotta give credit where credit due, was created by Karen, and the post-production work was hers also. Uh, you're just looking at this, we have an, uh, a lovely, lovely uh, sense of dimension here with a very soft light, but there's definitely highlights and shadows. You take a look, those shadows over here, shadows over there, and, and, and you have your highlights, the spectral highlights over here. Now, there are also terms that I'm going to use to describe backgrounds. High key, subject has a light background. Okay? You have low key, the subject has a dark background. And then there's medium key, where the subject not only has a dark background, but is dressed up and looks kind of silly. Mid-tone. Now, in controlling the light. Sometimes we are blessed with absolutely perfect lighting. Okay? I, I mean, this is, what, this is what I call God's light, God's studio, and take full advantage of that. This particular scene over here, we're photographing bride and groom before the wedding, and they had this huge room with huge windows, northern light coming in. It was just yummy. There's nothing that I had to do to add to it. We just add, had natural bounce. The light was bouncing all around. I had beautiful, I didn't have to control anything. Here, the same thing. This is outdoors in, in April uh, in Central Park. It was a high overcast. It was just gorgeous. 
And uh, that lovely reflection, by the way, was not there when I photographed it. That lovely reflection was put in there post-production by my lovely wife. Just to add a little interest. Okay. Now, again, I was doing some family shots for a bar mitzvah. I had uh, an outdoor area. It was a beautiful day. It was a very sunny day. But they had a porch area over here, if you take a look, uh, white porch. The light was coming from, the, uh, from behind me and a little bit off to my, my left. I had perfect lighting over here. I have, if you think, I have a highlight, okay, a key light. I, the, the light that is bouncing around is my fill light. And where did the hair light come from? Remember, I said this is all natural light. Where did the hair light come from? From the sun. It came originally from the sun. But the side of the building there, you see where the, the sunlight's coming in? It's coming in from this direction over here. You see how the, see the, the, the highlights in the shadow? Okay. The side of the building was bouncing light right back into her. Had white white walls all around, and I had a natural kicker light, natural rim light. I had everything done naturally. It's just a question of positioning the subjects in the right place. And you can see over here how I had a very even lighting also. But my 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 exposure from from here to here was maybe within an, a, a quarter of a stop. So you couldn't ask for better anything better than that. Now. Sometimes the light is not perfect. This was uh, done at a lighting demonstration for our professional group about two, three years ago. It was supposed to be outdoor lighting uh, uh, seminar. And when we got there, it was raining. We went indoors. Do, can you tell this was done on a rainy day uh, uh, indoors? Okay. What I did is a technique which I learned from other pros is if you're working indoors and you open up windows or doors, and you can shoot outside with an outside background, but still be inside. You see this right over here? That's the frame of the door. We were actually inside. I was working with a softbox as my main light source. I had a reflector. And basically, the background was an outdoor background. But this is just giving the illusion that I'm working outdoors when I was actually nice and dry inside. Now. There are several tools that we have to control outdoor lighting. Certainly, you can change the location if the lighting's not right. You don't want to shoot in bright sunlight. If you're outdoors, go in a shaded area, OK? You have that option. As, again, as a professional, if the light's not right, you change you, the, the circumstances. We use reflectors. This is an absolutely essential tool. It bounces light from the main light source, softens the shadows, creates uh, uh, highlights in the eyes. Remember, they say the eyes are the windows of the soul? Well, uh, it's important to, bound, to make sure that you get catch lights in the eyes. And a lot of time, using a nice reflector, you could do that. Uh, electronic flash fill, which is using electronic flash at a lower intensity than the natural light. And it gives. Uh, and it, and it also has the advantage, uh, we were talking about color temperature. If you're working outdoors, or actually working indoors, and you have light that's bouncing around, it picks up the colors from what's around you. Now, if we're outdoors in a, um, an area with a lot of greenery, what happens to the, to the light that's bouncing around? What color does it pick up? It picks up the green. And unless you're a Klingon, green skin is not really flattering. And if you use a little electronic flash that's at a lower intensity than the outdoor ambient lighting, it cleans up the colors. It's a very important tool. You don't want to overfill because you just get a, a flash look. Okay, You want to keep that. And I'll, sh I'll show you examples of this later. You could also use off-camera lighting. And this gives you uniform exposures. You don't have to worry if the clouds are covering the sun and you're going in and out. And sometimes that can drive you crazy if you're just using uh, outdoor lighting and, 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 and natural lighting. And, the color, and, the, and, the, and the ex your exposure is constantly changing because the sun is going behind clouds. If you're using a, an, a, an off-camera flash, and I basically do that usually bounce into an umbrella, my exposure for the subject is always constant. I don't have to worry about that. 
And then you have modifiers, such as umbrellas or soft boxes, to soften the light source. And then you have gobos to block unwanted light. Okay? Does anyone know what, uh, familiar with the term gobo? G-O-B-O? Okay. For those of you that are not, this side of my, my reflector bounces the light. I like having a black-sided reflector because if you have a light source, you ever, you ever photograph somebody and that, that pinpoint of light from the sun is right on the nose and it really looks terrible? Use a gobo. Block that sunlight. You can turn it this way also and get a little bounce reflector if you have another light source. You see, by the way, do you see how, the, how that light source is being bounced right into me? Beautiful. Beautiful. I'm, just, I'm, I'm more beautiful than I was before, a moment ago. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, several years ago, I was delivering uh, an order to clients out on Long Island. And uh, across the street were clients that were, uh, I was photographing uh, a bar mitzvah about uh, three weeks in, in, uh, later. And the mother said to me, hey, can you take some pictures of my son? He's in his baseball uniform. I want some pictures. And at that point, uh, all I had was my little pocket camera. Wait a minute. I wasn't there to set up to do portraits. I was there to deliver an order, OK? This was basically what I had in my, in my camera case, all right? I take him to the back. What's wrong with this picture? Take a look. What's wrong with this picture in terms of lighting? We're talking, I'm sorry? There's no details. There's no, there's no direction of light here. He's lost. He, if you take a look at the face, OK? The, the main light source is behind him. There's no detail there. You can't see any catch light or anything. I walked him around to the other side of the, uh, of the house. They had a garage with white doors, OK? I set up that bright area over there where I, where I moved him from. We just moved about uh, 15 or 20 feet. I now have, I went from a high-key background to a low-key background. This kicker light over here is the reflected light coming in from this. It's bouncing right off of this, right onto him, giving me a kick of light. The light on his face is the light that is bouncing off the garage doors. It's my natural reflector. Again, I was able to use this little camera. We did a poster of him afterwards, which I sold for a nice chunk of change based upon a shot I did with this and a garage door as my light source. So, I mean, again, as pros, if the light's not right, you have to know how to change the situation and make it right for yourself. Okay, reflectors bounce light towards the subjects, create a direction of light, and or control contrast. It's really important. If you have deep shadows, you don't sometimes you don't want those deep shadows. A reflector bounces light back into there, okay? Now, here we used a reflector with window light, and I had a large reflector placed camera right, okay? It's off to the right with a light source that was basically window light. And if you take a look over here, we have nice soft shadows. She, she was a little bit behind here. You can see how there's a shadow cast from, from, from the other sister, the younger sister onto the, uh, uh, to the older sister. It's okay because if there was not a reflector there, this would be totally black. And because I had a reflector in this position over here, it was bouncing light into the shadows, and I was able to get so, uh, a, a very soft, translu uh, transparent shadow. Okay, now, we were in the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens. I don't know if anyone's wor worked there. Uh, everyone has got a camera, but as soon as you're a professional photographer, they know you're a professional photographer, the most important piece of equipment they want to see is that $300 check. So I usually go there with, with clients, and you know the, the bride is always my niece, or the groom is my nephew. It's personal. As soon as you take something out, like a reflector or an off-camera flash, uh, in a flash, the security people are on you. And I saw this, this area over here was gorgeous. I wanted the bluebells in the background and so forth. Very cute shot, but I did not like the light pattern. Used a reflector. Got two quick shots over here before the uh, police side came and told me, you got to put it away. Uh, are you a professional photographer? I said, yes, I am, but this is my niece. I'm photographing. We're doing some nice 
personal photos for her. But in the meantime, I was able to change this into this. Now, let's, let's take a closer look for a moment. A reflector directs the light, and I want you to notice the catch lights. Take a look at the difference between the light pattern here and the light pattern here, and look at the, how the eyes pop. There were two catch lights here. This catch light is from the daylight coming in, and this catch light at the very bottom is from my reflector. Look how the eyes just pop. Very simple piece of equipment. It weighs next to nothing. It folds up next to nothing. You should have this in your camera bag all the time. It's a really vital piece of equipment. <clears throat> if you're photographing uh, still life, and I mean uh, commercial photographers use reflectors all the time. It's not just, it, it's not just for people anymore. <laughs> all right, here we have wraparound reflectors. It was interesting because uh, this maternity shoot um, we did in um, one of the women's uh, parents' home on Long Island. And uh, what we had over here, uh, what looks like window light, it actually is uh, light coming through the window, but it's in, in um, uh, electronic strobe uh, in, in a big umbrella, okay? But I didn't, I, what we did is we had reflectors around over here, and I asked the father if uh, they had um, a machine or something like that, and he said, sure. And I was going to tape it up, and uh, he, he just went pop, pop, pop with a, with, a, with a stapler. He just stapled that up there for me. And I had a, a beautiful tent lighting situation where the, the light coming in just bounced around, and it just created that beautiful three-dimensional lighting. And then electronic flash fill light, and it gives better exposure and adds details, shadows, and more accurate skin tones. Okay? This was done in the end of the, or middle of November, about a year ago. And the bride wanted outdoor photographs. And we, it was late in the day. They got started late, whatever. This was about uh, 4.15 in the afternoon. The light level was drastically low. Luckily, we have cameras that we can up the ISO. I shot this at about an ISO of 6,400. But I still was not getting that, I was, I was getting a muddiness to it. I put my electronic flash on, I dialed it down to 1 64th power or 1 1 28th power, just to give that little wink. You would not believe that there was a flash here. This looks like just on, on an ordinary day, late in the afternoon. There was almost no light here, but the quality of the light was improved and the look was improved because I was using a flash fill to really clean that, that, that look up and give a little pop. All right. Uh, this is a photograph of our oldest daughter. Uh, she's now in her 30s. We were at a friend's house up in Connecticut, and it was, Connecticut has the most wonderful foliage in the world in October. And this is in front of the house, and right behind me, about three feet behind where I was standing, is the house that is really dark. There was no light bouncing back in there. And I didn't have an off-camera flash, but I had one flash on, on, on my camera, and I just use that to give my proper exposure. So it's, it's, a, it's direct flash on there. But I was able then to increase my shutter speed to bring down that very hot background so that I'm balancing the foreground and the background. One thing that you should be aware of, in controlling any exposure, you have two variables. There's your f-stop, your aperture, and your shutter speed. What controls ambient light? Which one of those control ambient light, the, the natural constant light source? Aperture. Aperture, correct, as well as shutter speed. Both do. With strobe, with electronic flash, the only thing that can control your exposure is changing your aperture, your f-stop. Reason, if a flash goes off at a 5,000th of a second, what difference is a 60th of a second or a 125th of a second going to make? It's the duration is almost instant. So the shutter speed really has no bearing upon your exposure when you're dealing with flash. You can only control it by your f-stop, the, 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 how wide your, your diaphragm is. So when you're dealing with combined photographs such as this, which has a natural light source, an ambient light source, and a flashlight source, 
you have to set your, your exposure, your, uh, your aperture first for the flash and then change your shutter speed to get the correct background. That's the only way you can do that. So just remember that limit, uh, particularly with cameras that have what's called focal plane shutters. Most digital cameras these days have a focal plane shutter and you're limited to sync at flash to about a 200th or a 250th of a second, depending upon what model camera. They do have high-speed flash. I don't want to go into that. That's, that's a uh, high-speed sync. That's, that's a topic for another uh, lecture, another, another program. But basically, you're, you're limited to your shutter speeds. So just remember that. Off-camera flash gives uniform exposures and balances the background exposures, just what I told you. All right. I think you may have seen this at the very beginning, okay? This is the first two shots that I, turns an amateur snapshot into a professional shot. The picture on the left, I actually did with my cell phone. That's, I just wanted, uh, I was really thinking in terms of this, of this program. I wanted to show the difference. First of all, I changed my, uh, I, I used my, my, I used Canon 5Ds and 5D Mark III's. I put a long lens on this so that what happens with a telephoto lens, I started blurring out the background. I didn't want all the details back over here. And I had an off-camera main light source in an umbrella. My, my friend Timothy in the foreground here was my assistant on that, right? And he can attest to the fact that I had uh, an off-camera flash and a reflector. And that's basically how I got the difference in look between the left and the right. Off-camera directional lighting turns an amateur snapshot into a professional portrait by taking a flat image and adding the third dimension. This was a, uh, a couple who, uh, the, the bride is the daughter of very good friends of ours. He's also a professional photographer. And when I shot this, my off-camera light didn't fire, okay? I had the correct exposure for, for this, but the second shot, it did fire. Look at the difference in the, in the, in the three-dimensional look with a light source that is coming from off-camera. This is flat, that's dynamic. And I think Timothy can attest to the fact because he was holding the flash and it was his fault that it didn't go off, right? Uh, the first time, right? Can I set up the shot? Karen set up the shot. That's right, Karen set up the shot. <laughs> Off-camera light it can also fix pesky bright sunlight and contrast problems. You have the sun coming from over here. His face without any flash is in deep shadow. I have an off-camera flash coming from ca camera right giving Look at the mask of the face over here. Look at the perfect lighting ratio here. You have, you have a kicker light, you have a hair light, you have a fill light, and you have a, a key light or a main light there. It's just like working in the studio. But I'm, I'm using tools that enable me to give portrait quality lighting on location. The same thing here. Where's the light coming from? Take a look at that hair light over there. So where's, where's, where's the light coming from? From behind and above. If I'm just using my natural light there, they're gonna, you, you won't see any detail on their face. So I was able to really to get beautiful portrait lighting on both of these on location and make it look as if I'm a real professional. Uh, this is also an example of uh, working with flash outdoors. I was able to work with a fast shutter speed, get the exposure and freeze them in midair. But I get, if you take a look, there's, there's good exposure on every, all the faces there. That has to do with the fact that my off-camera lighting is able to give me consistent exposure. And by the way, they, they were in midair for about 10 seconds, so I shot several <laughs> shots. Uh, now, when using off-camera lighting outdoors, take care not to lose the natural look. Which looks natural and which looks artificial? You tell me. Left... What looks, what looks out of artificial? Which one is more artificial? Left or right? Left. Left, okay. There is an overfill flash over here. This, again, if you take a look, this natural key light, uh, hair light over here, uh, uh, beautiful soft lighting. If you take a look at the eyes again, you can take a look. There are two catch lights in the eyes. Now, what happened here, I was photographing a graduation from a family I'd done a number of parties for in the past. And uh, this young lady was graduating uh, college, if I'm not mistaken. I think she was graduating Juilliard, actually. And we were at Lincoln Center, and I had a whole setup, and I was allowed to photograph there for about 15 minutes. 
and I broke everything down, and we were back, basically packing up, and she said, oh, I want a picture with my best friend. Well, I wasn't going to set up the lighting again. I just put the, I had the, the off-camera light was still up. Pop, we shot a, a shot, but I didn't have my camera on tripod because this was shot at about a 30th or a 15th of a second to bring in all that beautiful ambient light in the background. These were shot about five minutes apart. So the, the light itself didn't really change. The natural light didn't change. But my ability to get, to get this look absolutely changed. But I got the picture. It was important for me to get the picture. I wasn't going to say I'm not going to shoot it. But there is a definite difference in the look. OK, modifiers. We spoke about umbrellas, a softbox. Anyone know what a softbox is? Not know any of these terms, let me know. A scrim. You know what a scrim is? A scrim, OK. Someone's shaking their head. I, again, I don't want to use terms that you don't know because I think it's a, I don't want to go past you. A scrim is usually a translucent panel that could either act as a background, you can shoot through it to give very soft lighting, and uh, a lot of times will act as, as a gobo or, or a, for instance, if you have direct sunlight coming through, if it shoots through a scrim, all of a sudden it becomes this huge window and softens the light. It's, it's a very good tool to have. Uh, you can also use barn doors, grids, and, and, and snoots. This is a professional barn door. You put this over here, you can close it down a little bit. Uh, my first, and the term of snoot is, is one that is not movable, okay, just like a cone. My first snoot was a large ricotta cheese can that I put a rubber band around and I sprayed, the, uh, I sprayed it black so people wouldn't think that I'm, uh, that I'm using a ricotta cheese can. And I put that over my, 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 my flash. And, uh, you know, you, you do what you got to do. But the concept is the same. Right now, I'm limiting the flow of the light and the direction of light. I'm, I'm, I'm able to focus it on my subjects. These are very simple tools, but they're important ones to, be, uh, to have in your, in, 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 your, in your toolkit. And Mother Nature cannot be dependent upon to do what you, you want upon request. So you have to be able to modify it, okay? And that's not what I mean by, by uh, uh, umbrella lighting, okay? Here we have umbrella used as a main or a fill light. On the left, I had my, my uh, this was on the Brooklyn Heights promenade. If you take a look at the shadows, okay, you see how you have the shadows over here? My main light was camera right. I couldn't have it camera left because it, it would have been right on the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. So I'm shooting over here. I wanted to get that nice background uh, uh, of, of the city there. They turned into the sun. Now, all of a sudden, what became my main light? My main light was my sunlight. The, hot, the, 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 the most intense light that's your exposure is your key light or your main light. I brought my umbrella around behind the camera, and that became my fill light. So I'm just changing my tools. And if you take a look at the background, the exposure was identical for each of these shots, because the background looks exactly the same. If there was a difference in, the, the, in, uh, in how deep the background was or how light the background was, I'm changing my exposure. But my exposure here, I'm exposed perfectly for the skin tones, and here I'm uh, exposed for the skin tones. It's just a question of which, which light sources I'm using. I'm just changing it. Okay, a softbox. This was done during that uh, photo uh, shoot that I was telling you about, about uh, that started off on a rainy day. It stopped raining. And uh, this, this is our, our friend Will, who's our uh, other instructor. And I asked them to take a picture of us, and uh, they took the picture of my, my softbox didn't fire. This is the second shot. Look at the difference. Same, same subjects, slightly, uh, uh, and, and just a different light source. And you take a look at how much better, how much three-dimensional, more three-dimensional this looks than this. This, you have shadows the wrong places. You have your bags, the, the eyes look like they have bags under them. You're, you're able to do things with directional lighting that you're controlling, and that's what this is all about. This is without the softbox, and that's with the softbox. Barn doors, remember this little thing here? If you're familiar with um, the lighting style of the 1940s, we have uh, movie lighting where it's very dramatic. A lot of times you had a hot light, and then you would... Uh, uh, use a barn door or a snoot to just light up part of the face here. The same thing over here. I'm using, I have a kicker light over here and I have um, a, um, a limited, I didn't want the flare over here so I, I, I snooted, I, I use my barn doors to close down the lighting 
so that I would just get a very uh, uh, narrow pattern right over there because I had a very small room to work with there. All right, a gobo. Gobo blocks the light. If you take a look over here, you can see a little reflection. I had a crisscross lighting pattern set up here, okay? The main light was coming this way, and I had another light coming this way that gives that hair light. You see how the, you have the, the light over here? If I weren't using a gobo, I would have had a flare coming right into my lens because, again, I was in a limited area there, and I wanted to make sure that the light was blocked into the, into the lens. I didn't want the, the, the flare in the lens. I just wanted the light shining on the subjects. So gobos are very important uh, tools. Learn to balance both ambient and electronic light sources, okay? Here we're using bounce light and the ambient light. You can take a look, there's like a yellowish tinge to that. That's really from the ambient light here. But the, the light that is illuminating them is bouncing off the ceiling from the flash. Here I have off-camera umbrella lighting and a main light that's a vertically bouncing off the ceiling too. Why did I not think about this for a second? Why did I not set up my fill light right around camera position? Okay. This would reflect it. You'd see a big umbrella right over here. So what I did is I brought my fill light off to the side. I bounced it off the ceiling so that you would get some bounce light into the shadow areas here. You see, you see how that's... Uh, it's not a very, very deep shadow, but I brought my main light off to the side this way to illuminate them, and I did not want to get any reflections in the, in, in, in the, in the glass. Again, it's something that you as a photographer and as a professional, you don't want to have, you know, you don't want to spend time correcting your mistakes later on. You're just wasting your time in Photoshop. If you can eliminate something before it happens, then you're saving yourself a lot of time and effort. Now here we have directional bounce flash as the main light. Indoors, soft shadow, so where's the light coming from? Camera right or left? It's coming from camera right, it's bouncing off, it's bouncing off the wall this way. The same thing here. You have a very narrow area over here, you have light bouncing off this way, and uh, whatever, I think there was a shirt, another shirt hanging there and that's, that's giving me my, my, my fill light over there. So again, you have to adapt to the circumstances. Here, my flash is a rim light, okay? It's shooting into the bride. You see how it's illuminating uh, the veil over here? And I used a long exposure, a half second exposure on a tripod to make sure that I'm getting that beautiful light in the room there. But I'm controlling what's, what's happening there because I know what I want to do. I'm bringing your attention. What's, what's the brightest area in that? Squint. Where does your eye go? <coughs> Squint again. Where is your eye going in that subject? In that, the veil. It's going right to the bride. That's what I wanted that to do. Okay, now, I have a studio lighting on, set up on, on, on location over here. If you take a look, there's a portable light over here. There's a main light over here. And I also have a camera light, which is my fill light. This, this was done without flash, by the way. This is just, I mean, that's why you have that, that, that uh, yellowish look. I then moved in. If you take a look, there's the light on the face. You can see he has a, 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 a kick or a hair light, or no hair light, rather, uh, coming from over here. Go back for a second. That's illuminating them, coming right over here. That, you see how you, you have a, a hair light over there? Give a little definition and separation from the background. That's from that other light, the crisscross lighting. This is exactly what I'm doing here. I have two main lights here. I have a main light on the mother, a main light on the little girl, crisscross. My camera light is actually bounced off the ceiling, so I'm getting a fill light over here. And here I had much more dramatic lighting. Two lights crisscross, but it's a much more dramatic look than this because I don't really have a fill light there. This was also a long exposure because I wanted to get the, those nice warm lights, uh, the sconces. So I'm, I'm utilizing both light sources, but the main light is definitely strobe on both of these. Now, this may look like a total candid. It is. It's a candid shot. They looked up. I didn't really have to pose them. They were cutting the cake. Look up. But again, remember we're talking about portrait lighting? I have a main light lighting up the face. 
I have fill light for my camera, which is at less intensity than my main light. I have a kicker light over here. You see how I'm getting that separation? And the background is natural lighting. And you could take a look, you could even see detail on that white cake. If I was just using straight flash, you would never get any of that detail on the cake or any of the detail on a dress. It would just be blown out. So again, it's controlling your light. Take a look over here. I have a, a room full of people that I'm able to light. I have, a crisp, I have a light coming from this direction. This is not retouched or anything. It actually, there's a little flare over there. You see that? There's a light over there. There's a light coming from over here, and there's camera light over here. And I have detail of maybe 75 or 100 people on the dance floor because I'm using multiple lighting there. Different uh, approaches to doing group, large groups and dancing and so forth. This is basically a high ISO. Karen shot this in the same job. This is the same couple. Okay, She bounced the light over there. We're able to get uh, a lot of the ambient light going on and so forth. This is, again, I have actually four or five lights going off on this, on this shot to give detail in the background, on the bride and groom, and so forth. And there's a difference in color because this, this is a high ISO, fairly low shutter speed and a fairly wide f-stop. You're getting a lot of the lighting from the room, which is good. It's a, it's a good thing, but it's a different look. Now, we're going to play for a little bit. I'm going to give you a bunch of photos, and from what you've learned, you tell me what, wh how it's lit, okay? Here's the first one. And you get extra credit, by the way, if you, if, if you learn what, what to do here. Anyone know, where, where, what's the light? Yell it out. Go ahead. Natural light from the window. Natural light from the window. That's, we got that. Ambient uh, window, main light, and how to reflect the fill. If you take a look, again, look at the catch light in the eye. You see that catch light in the eye? And there's a catch light up over here. See the two catch lights there? The one over here is from the window. The one over here is from the reflector that's underneath her. Really good way to analyze photographs. Just look at the cache lights. Okay. What's the lighting on this? And don't tell me it was the video light. Really, really tough lighting situation. Bill? Very harsh lights. Very hard. Well, actually, I have a fairly high intensity fill, fill flash. My main, my main exposure was obviously I had to get detail here and detail on the highlight. But my fill flash was fairly powerful because it filled in. You have a fairly uh, transparent shadow over here. She's totally in shadow. If I weren't using a strong fill flash, she would be absolutely, you would get no detail whatsoever there. If I can just quickly tell the story of the two brides. We went with these two brides to City Hall to get their marriage license. They came in their military uniforms. And just by coincidence, it was the day that the Supreme Court came and decided the Edie Windsor case and essentially legalized gay marriage. And there we were. And the news just happened to be there. And of course, because they were in their uniforms, they got interviewed. And that was the shot. Right place, right time. Okay, so this is ambient light with Phil Flesh. That guy Phil is a great photographer. Uh, okay, what's the light? What's the lighting here? Yes, sir. It's better than ambient. It's it's better than ambient. 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 It's better than ambient. Okay. Well, there is an ambient light source, and it's a natural ambient light with a reflector. That's all that is. I had beautiful light coming in from behind me. Didn't have to do a thing with it, but I did use a reflector to, to get a little pop there. This is a toughie. This is a main light umbrella off camera on the girl, okay? There's a second light in the background of the subject. She's blocking that second light. I have a stand there that's coming across, but I have absolutely no fill light on them. Do you see how deep those shadows are? That's what happens if you don't have any fill light. But I don't have a fill light on her. What's, what's filling in the shadow? I'd say the reflection of the color 
Yeah, exactly. The lectern and the Torah are reflecting light back up into her. So you have light coming this way and bouncing up this way. And that's why you have a transparent shadow here and no detail whatsoever in the shadow there. But for a for a, a, an example of something that's an interesting photograph, it's, 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 it's definitely controlled by me. But this is not just a snapshot. This is something that a lot of thought goes into how, how it's lit. Go ahead. Okay. You're, what type of uh, strobes are you using okay. to light this? Is it, are you using speed lights or are you using studio strobes okay. on location? This is actually a combination of a uh, studio strobe was in an an umbrella here at an AC unit, and I had a portable unit behind her. This, uh, the unit I'm using here was something called an armatar, which I no longer use. It had a, um, a, um, uh, a large flash head on a Vivitar body. But now I'm using portable lights. I'm using um, uh, 580 Canons. Uh, I have a, um, what's the other one? Uh, I, I have one Q flash, and I still use Dyna lights as my, my studio lights. So uh, I'm, I'm old school in that respect. I like, I like working with, with main lights that have uh, 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 a modeling light ability. So I see exactly where the light's going. You're mixing the studio lights today yeah. with the speed light. Canon speed lights? Yeah, Canon. I, I, I use Canon systems. I'm using uh, 5D Mark III's. And I have 580 speed lights. So anyway, let's go to this one. This was a happy day for our family. It was our daughter's wedding. And my friend Owen, whose daughter I photographed, photographed our daughter. So tell me about the lighting here. Where's the sunlight coming from? Go ahead, yeah. It's coming right from the top. You see, you see right over there? It's coming almost straight down. How we're lighting the faces? Uh, it's for, uh, uh, yes, HDR, okay? It's not a composite. It's not a composite shot with HDR. This was done with two speed lights, one off camera, one on camera, lighting up the faces. That's all that is. So you have two portable lights on, on the group here with the, main, with the background and the hair light from, uh, from Mother Nature. Okay, direct off camera main light with ambient light. Oh, we had ambient light filled too, because you do have some light from the foreground. And, a, and the hair light is uh, ambient. Okay, how's that lit? Okay, bounce off the ceiling. Bouncing off the wall. Okay, you're, you're, you are correct in the, that there is bounce light there, but the bounce light is actually the f fill light. Off camera flash is in an umbrella. I have, I have that in, in a Dynalite umbrella over here. It's coming from over in the corner over here on her, and the, the, my, my camera light, which is a speed light, is just bounced right off the ceiling. That's what that is. And, I'm, and if you take a look, I, I definitely wanted to get her uh, reflection in there. And that side of her is being, you see how you have a full illumination here? You're illuminating the, the uh, uh, highlight side in the mirror, and that's coming from my umbrella light. Again, tough lighting situation. Basically, we had fl a, a flash fill with ambient main light. My, my sunlight was coming in over here. I had a very strong flash fill, just like the one with the, with the, with the, uh, the two brides in uniform. Exact same kind of situation. Yes. I have another question. Go ahead. Did you shot this. Yes, I, I shot this one. Okay, my question. Uh, did you use an on-camera filter, or was the softening effect applied in Photoshop? Take the, take the, mic the, the microphone. Okay. So this was actually, they were laying on the cobblestones. It was just daylight, plain old daylight, and I shot straight down at them. There's a lot of retouching in term to get that softness on the skin tones, okay? But there was no special filter or anything on the camera, all right? It's just to get the sharpness where I wanted it and to get the softness where I wanted it. That was done post-production. But the light, the light itself was very, very soft. It was a, sort of a natural light, but it was, it was a high overcast. High overcast. It was beautiful, beautiful lighting there. We were in, in, in fairly open shade. And there was definitely a direction of light there, as you could see, because you could see that there's a shadow there. If, if it was coming directly over their faces, you wouldn't have had the shadow on, on the bride's face. Again, 
I showed you this before when, when we were talking. You see how you have that, the shadow area there? So it's coming really from an oblique angle down this way. Something we just shot two weeks ago. Yeah, this is, main light is off camera flash, bounced off a wall at camera left and natural sunlight on the background. And I gotta say, we were about to bring in my uh, big Dynalite and Timothy said to me, let's just use the white wall as, 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 as your light source, turn my speed light into that. And the speed light bounced on the wall was giving me that perfect lighting on the face. Uh, I had natural light um, uh, as, as, a, as my fill light. And this light coming in from here is my hair light and my background light. And that's natural sunlight coming through there. So it was really able to balance that very, very, uh, um, not easily, but we compensated for the fact that there was bad lighting on her face. We created the lighting on her face. The rest of it's natural. Okay, if you remember those two sisters uh, that we photographed where one was slightly behind the other, this is the mother, same lighting situation. We have a window light over here. We have a large reflector over here. Window light with reflector. Very natural look. You obviously like this picture because you, <laughs> you used it in the PR, okay? Okay, perfect silhouette. This is ambient light only. As a photographer, you, you, you utilize situations and you place your subjects in the light. Actually, they, they were not in the light, they were in front of the light. So this, the placement here is very important. And again, if you squint, your eye goes right to them, right? Squint, look right to them. All right, here again, we have a situation with natural window light. Uh, this divan was on the other side of the room and on Karen's suggestion, we actually pulled it closer there to get a better exposure and to give some very dramatic lighting. So um, this is- I, I have to give credit where credit was due. I picked the location and the setup, but you said, let's drag it closer okay. to the window. Okay. <laughs> that was right. seeing the light. Okay, that's, that's exactly what it is. It's seeing the light and knowing the intensity of the light. Because on the far side of the room, it was much too weak. I wanted a stronger light source there. And this is an interesting one. Okay, the story, this was actually in a photo class uh, at uh, Sleepy Hollow. It's at, this, at the cemetery there. This was shot at about 12 midnight. This is a four minute exposure. I got in front of the camera, which was on a tripod. It was wide, it was, it was maybe about an F8 exposure for four minutes. I used a flashlight and spelled my name. P-A-U-L. Why don't you see me in this? Because the light that you pick up from it's out front and it's picking up the flashlight, but it's not on you. Yeah, there was no light on me. The light level on, on this, uh, on the background there, was very, very low. And the sky looks like it's lit, lit up. That's the afterglow from New York City. If you're ever coming in from out of town and you're coming in at night, uh, you can see the... Any large city, you could see like this, like this dome, very faint dome of light. On a four minute exposure, it comes out, it looks like it's at sunset, it's not. That's literally at midnight. So uh, that was a combination of four minute time exposure, painting with light, ambient light with, with daylight temperature, flashlight. And the daylight temperature flashlight, what color did it become? Because I'm shooting an, uh, uh, on a, an ISO of 3200. What color did the flashlight turn into? Blue because that's at 6,400. Again, color temperatures, okay? There's a great quote from George Eastman. Light makes photography. Embrace light, admire it, love it, but above all, know light. Know it for what it, all it's worth, and you will know the key to photography. And that's all, folks. Anyway, any questions? Wait, wait, yes. Wait, 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 wait. Oh. Yeah. Earlier we talked about the subject of incandescent. Yes. That's the same incandescent as uh, these to refer a long time ago as incandescent bulbs or incandescent street light, incandescent street lighting. So, 
Oh, incandescent. Okay. Street lighting, actually today, street lighting is a combination of lighting. It's, uh, it's sodium vapor, okay? And I, that's, that's in phase efforts, though. Phase, phase light. Yeah, but in LEDs. LEDs, okay. But the color temperature borders on, I think it's about 5,000 or 4,800. It's more towards fluorescent. It's a greenish hue on, on, uh, on street lamps. You, you get a greenish look to that. So uh, again, if you're photographing on, on a daylight setting in your camera, and, and if you have any kind of uh, controls on a digital camera, just know that you can change either the Kelvin setting. I like changing it to, uh, uh, most of my shots are done actually in a cloudy day setting, which is about 5400. It's good for daylight, it's good for strobe, it's good for, uh, for, for uh, any kind of light that is around the five to 6000 uh, Kelvin. As soon as you go and you're using a light source such as this, you have to change it if that's your only light source, because otherwise you get color shifts. You want good skin tones. You want good, uh, I mean, if you're photographing commercially, you want what your clothing looks like. You want for the, the actual colors. So you have to be aware of your color temperature based upon what your light source is. So on that note, do you use a color temperature meter or a phone meter strength? Well, to be honest with you, um, um, uh, uh, I'm using my experience in terms of knowing what, uh, what uh, setting to put on the camera. Uh, I mean, you can use, uh, 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 you can shoot by cards. A, a, lot of, a lot of photographers will take a, a particular scene and you'll, you'll use a gray card. Uh, uh, I used to use, when uh, we were still shooting film, I would actually shoot, photograph a Kodak box color because the lab knew exactly what the color was on the Kodak box. They had something called a Shirley. A Shirley was a photograph that Kodak had of a woman with a color wheel, okay? And every lab had a Shirley, and it was called a Shirley because the woman holding that, her name was Shirley, okay? And they used that to uh, gauge what the color of your end product was, what your prints were. But we have control over, you see, when you're shooting with film, you couldn't, unless you were changing color, uh, uh, f uh, film types, you were set with a certain kind of film. You had real daylight film, or you had tungsten film. And you had to physically change the role of film. But now we could do it on the fly in the camera, depending upon what the light source is and what, what the circumstances. You could change your ISO. You can go from an ISO of 100 to an ISO of 10,000. I mean, you, you do have, there are limits in terms of noise and you have noise reduction, and cameras today have, I, I mean, you could shoot at 10,000 ISO, and it looks like uh, uh, older cameras shooting at ISO 400. It's really, the technology today is really amazing, but you have to be able to master the technology. Every one of you is smarter than your camera, okay? Don't let the camera decide for you. I shoot on a manual mode all the time. I don't use uh, 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 auto, color, okay? I don't set, set my, my, my camera. I set the camera color setting, the t color temperature setting. I'm smarter than the camera. I mean, you can get it 85, 90% of the time, but if you're a pro, you don't want 85% of your pictures to be okay and 15% not to be okay. And then you gotta correct it, you, you gotta make excuses. That's not what a professional does. A professional nails it. I learned, you know, I, I shot film for most of my professional life. And when you're shooting film, every time you hit the shutter, it was 75 cents. 75 cents. Nobody did a wedding shooting 5,000 pictures when you're shooting film. Okay? I mean, you, you, t right now people, you know, what they do uh, is known as spray and pray. You shoot enough, you'll get some things that are right. I grew up and I was taught to get it right in the camera. All the things that you can do afterwards should be artistic control. You shouldn't have to, you shouldn't have to uh, uh, make, make excuses for your technical mistakes and try to correct them. You should get it right when you hit that shutter. Be aware of your lighting, be aware of your exposures. Be aware of all these things. A lot of them are instinctive to me. It's like learning to drive. The first time you learn to drive, it's a whole series of, in, of, of independent moves. You open the, the door, you sit down, you adjust your seat, you put the key in, you, you, th you have to think. When, when you're an experienced driver, you're driving, you're not thinking about all these independent motions, they happen automatically. And as you gain experience as a photographer, these things happen 
automatically. I shoot weddings. I've done 2,500 weddings and, and, and events in my life. You can't take the time to, to do the things you can do in a studio setup when you're doing commercial work. Okay? You just don't have that time. You're given the amount of time that you have and you've got to produce. You could shoot a thousand photographs and the one picture that doesn't come out right is the one that the customer is going to bust the, your chops over. You've got to get it, you got to nail it right. You can't reshoot that. So the skills that I learned, and I learned in the trenches, I learned from other photographers. You know, in the old days, you, you used to have the guild system where someone would apprentice for 10 years and then become a leather craftsman or learn how to make gold or how to make glassware or, 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 or become an artist. I learned that way. And, you know, you look, I, I, education for me is in a continual, continual thing. I've gone to maybe a thousand programs in my life. I've done full week classes. I mean, I'm a master photographer. I am still learning. When a doctor graduates from medical school, he doesn't know everything about medicine because it changes every day. You're constantly going to, to, to seminars. You're learning. And this is something that it's, it's a lifelong process. Because you can't, you know, when we shifted from, when I shifted and the, and the photo industry shifted from film to digital, they say about a learning curve, it was more like a learning cliff. Because there was so much that you had to do. We are much, we're it's much. Taking out of the light, Oh, I'm so sorry. I let the microphone I'm sorry. <laughs> no, he was so adamant. But, um, Paul, I think you're absolutely right that we all have to keep learning and experimenting and, and looking. Right. And um, I think you've inspired us. I'm ready to, like, go out and break out my little flashes and my loom, loom cubes, <laughs> right, and, and go out and play. So I know that uh, some of the SVA students here are thinking about their midterms. Uh -huh. So help me in thanking Paul for inspiring you. Well, it is a pleasure. I, you, were one, you were a wonderful audience, and you're getting a car, and you're getting a car, and you're getting a car. Thank you very much for being here tonight. My wife, Karen, is over there, She's Karen Benjamin. She and I uh, are in business together, uh, and I've been a pro for 40 years. Um, I started off with a camera in my hands when I was about 10. I grew up not too far from the uh, SVA buildings on First Avenue in Stuyvesant Town. And uh, I, I, lo I was just enamored with photography. My dad was a fairly good amateur. I got the same camera he did so I could borrow his 135 millimeter lens. And when I went to Stuyvesant High School, I took my first photo class. And to this day, I remember that experience of seeing that first white piece of paper turn into an image. And let me tell you something. I said to myself, I want to do that. And it got me hooked. And uh, I was in, in college, in, in high school. I had a camera in my hands. And I started teaching New York City Board of Education. Um, and I went into photography full time the summer we got married. And I've been doing this ever since, and I just love it. And if you got a job that you love, it's, 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 it's the best thing. Um, photography, just talk about a basic for a moment. Uh, the Greek word photos meaning light, and graphy meaning the process of drawing. So photography is really drawing with light. Uh, amateurs. Basically, an amateur just hit the shutter. What's ever there, you take a picture, and you don't do any preparation or any thinking beforehand. As a professional...
functional, we've got to control the light to make it something else and to make it something that looks better. Uh, an artist's medium can be oils, charcoal, pastels, clay, granite, many other me uh, materials. Photographer's medium is light. That's what we work with. Light is our palette, our paintbrush, and the contrast between shadows and highlights creates the illusion of depth on a two-dimensional plane of every photographic image. It's the light that makes it pop, that gives it depth. Now, uh, I have a, about a four-minute slideshow here. And each one of the images shows you what light does and the, the, the ability to make it into something that's really special. A little piece of advice which I give to everybody. The most important thing about photography, look for the light before you take your picture. Where is the light coming from and what it's doing when it hits the subject. That's what you got to look for. Now if you can't move the subject and you can't move the light, move yourself. Here's a typical getting ready shot for, for a, a wedding. Karen actually uh, uh, shot this. Uh, where's the light coming from on this? It's window light, okay? It's, it's, coming, it's coming from this direction. If she was shooting directly into the window, what would happen to the subject? You get a silhouette. So in order to do that, we got a nice split light there on the face because the photographer moved to see the, to see the relationship of the subject and the, and the light. Static light source. Altering a camera angle creates visual excitement. Uh, matter of fact, this picture over here was one of the first photos that I ever did with uh, uh, my new EOS cell, uh, camera. This is, goes back about 20 years. And uh, I was in the dentist's office, and I had uh, done his family's pictures. Um, and he came in, the, uh, all the people in the office came in, and I, I just was playing with it. And this went into competition and won a loan collection. You know the title on this? This is called, uh, This Won't Hurt a Bit. <laughs> but it's just a question of where the light's coming from and make, making sure that it looks interesting. Okay, qualities of light. I think you get a pretty good idea of the variety of stuff we do. We're, we're a primarily a people photographer, and I've uh, always, always loved that the most. All right, now, when uh, Karen first 
got interested in photography. I 